We do love an economist, don't we? Just to get us talking at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I love this kind of idea that I'm an economist, here's the data, here's the argument, we need to bring down crime, that's our number one priority, we need better mobility in our cities. I might be wrong, I'm only an economist, but bring your own data and we can have an argument if, if, we, if you disagree. I just love that, you know, common sense breaking out there. Really enjoyed that presentation from Paul. Um, so I know what you're thinking apart from, okay, we need to bring down crime and sort out the roads. You're also thinking, who's the strange guy with a pink shirt on talking to us? So just to introduce myself briefly, my name's Gareth Mitchell. I'll be hosting our keynote uh, conversational panel. Um, I work at the BBC, at the BBC World Service, on a radio program called Click, which explores the way that technology affects our lives. So we are a, a technology program, which means a lot of people stop me and say, should I get a plasma TV or an LED TV, and what's the best gadget? And, and I have no idea. Partly because gadgets don't really work very well on the radio. They're not very radiogenic. So our program, it's a bit worthy. We think about how technology affects our lives. So I don't feel very at home at gadget gatherings because I, I just feel as if I'm not, not quite kind of with the people. But, uh, but I feel very at home here, literally having these serious conversations about how technology affects our lives. And obviously, which we all hope, we'll build better more functional, happier, more economically productive cities in the 21st century. That's all I'm going to say about me, you'll be relieved to know, because we all know what it's like when you go to a, to a conference, you, you never remember the people who chair the panels. You really remember the panelists and what they have to say, which is why I want to bring on our two panelists this morning. So uh, will you give them a very warm welcome? We have Matt Rogers from Nest. <laughs> and we have Aaron Bikshesh-Faran of Ericsson. So they're going to... They're going to take a, take a pew, as we say in the UK, and we're going to have a little chat. And it's not just the three of us having a little cosy fight. It's, it feels as if we're just hanging out in my living room here, actually. We could forget all Indeed. these people are out there. living room with a uh, hundred of your closest friends. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Should we just crack open a few beers? That would be nice. Who was at the garden party, by the way, last night? I don't know, any, any sore heads? And yeah, wasn't that fantastic? A big round of applause for the... The garden party. I'd literally just flown in from London and I'd been awake for 18 hours and I thought well, I'd just go for 10 minutes to be sociable and I was there, I was one of the last people to leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I'm wide awake this morning. Okay, so, so let, let's uh, crack on with it and, um, and have a, a sort of conversation and really what I want to explore with our panellists is our central theme here really at the at this New Cities Summit, which is about building a better metropolis for the uh, 21st century. Um, so let's just get to know our, our two speakers a little bit better. And we have Matt Rogers over here, who is the co-founder of Nest. So this is the intelligent heating systems, the uh, learning thermostat uh, acquired by Google in January of this year. I think it was January, wasn't it, uh, Matt? Uh, January, yeah. February. Okay, yes. right, January stroke February. Uh, definitely a good date, I'm sure, on Matt's own calendar. Uh, so first of all, uh, he's head of engineering, I should say, at Nest as well. Uh, hands up who has uh, a Nest system. A few hands going up. This is going to make Matt very happy. Our, our marketing guys have a lot of work to do. He's got a bit of work to do. Hands up who wants one. <laughs> Okay, so if you just take these people's names and numbers and write them down very quickly, we'll drum up a bit of business here. Um, and also, Matt, reading through your CV and your biog, and many people in this room will know as well that before you founded Nest, you were an Apple person and you were part of the design team on pretty much the, the three big products that we all know, the iPod, the iPhone, and, and the iPad. And I've always wanted to ask you this, and we'll finally get the chance. Here's, here's my iPhone, and I just wonder which features on this, stuff that goes on on this, this handset, which of them were, were you responsible for? So I can say, yeah, I know the guy. When next time I use it, I, I've met the guy who coded that. So. So, so, so this is the great thing about technology. So you probably bought this in the last year. Yeah. So, so I left Apple four years ago. Uh, almost everything I did at Apple has probably been changed. And, and, and like this, this, this product has is, is been around for four, since 2007, right? 2008. Uh, the stuff that we did then, you know, in terms of the hardware and the software design, it's probably been completely changed over. Probably nothing the same. Right. Yeah. So if, so if I was to go back home, because I still use my iPod Classic. Anybody still use an iPod Classic? I still love that device. So there must be things that you worked on on that then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's one that actually they haven't changed. Because like, like once you have this, this product, it's got a great exactly. hard drive in it. 
Just let it keep going. Yeah. It's a great product. I adore it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I won't look it, especially now that I know the guy, one of the guys who worked on it as well. Okay, so this, this is Matt. So you all know who Matt is, ladies and gentlemen. Let's uh, also say uh, hello here to Aaron, who many of you will know because he's with Ericsson, which of course is uh, a founding uh, partner of the New Cities Foundation. And um, you're Chief Marketing Officer at Ericsson. And, and again, help me out here as well. What Ericsson doesn't do anymore is make mobile phones. So what does Ericsson do? What, what is it as a company? That's a great introduction. We don't do mobile phones. And we offer a different interpretation for mobility. You know, uh, the gentleman before talked about mobility in terms of transportation. Uh, we work with uh, mobility in a different context called mobile communications. Uh, the networks that we build they handle about 45% of the world's traffic. Um, and uh, we uh, touch subscribers and manage subscribers uh, amounting to about a billion uh, every year. So that's the role that we play. We are passionate about technology, uh, and we see that uh, smartphones are uh, taking over a lot of the things that we do in a very useful way, and all of this is happening inside cities. So we are passionate about cities as well. So that's one of the reasons why we are uh, uh, a big part of New Cities Foundation. Marvellous, which actually cues up the first talking point that I had in mind, because I wanted to get this conversation going in earnest by thinking about mobile. And you two are the most obvious people to have here on this panel talking about this. I guess for you, Matt, mobile, is, it's the gateway into your product, into your offering, isn't it? And if you see kind of how you're going to interact with the rest of your world, so think about health, talk about your home, talk about your car, uh, the phone or your, your tablet is kind of that key interface. And... Uh, What's happened over the last few years with kind of the explosion of apps and kind of the proliferation of smartphones throughout the entire world, uh, that's where you're going to do a lot of your interaction. And when we're designing our products at Nest, we didn't design them so that you'd go your thermostat and program all these buttons. You'd go in your phone. That's how you'd, you use your product. And because you have that with you all the time, it enables all this connectivity and you can check in on things remotely. And uh, it's something that you've never been able to do before. And in terms of making our cities better, I, I suppose one obvious example is controlling your heating system. So you're on the metro system, you want to get your uh, heating sorted out. But in, in what other ways, a few matters, as, I mean, not just wearing your heating hat, but also just as a product designer and expert, how, how do they help us in our cities? So, so we've never had this many connected devices in our homes before. Uh, and now that we have kind of this critical mass, I'd say, we're able to actually do things in aggregate that we could never do before. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard of things called demand response, like things to manage peak load. Uh, it's a big deal in a lot of cities. Uh, before, what, what utility companies would do is they'd send out a signal over like FM radio to turn off someone's air conditioner. And that was never a very comfortable thing to do. Uh, people actually hated it. Uh, it turns out with modern systems, like with, with our thermostat that are connected to the internet, uh, utility companies, cities, municipalities could work with Nest, and in these peak times, we could send out signals to their thermostats, and instead of just turning off the air conditioning, actually manage it intelligently, keep them comfortable while also kind of managing the grid load. And these are things that we could never have done before. You have to have things on the internet. And this is kind of over the last two or three years we can do these things now. Yeah, and Aaron, you speak of this kind of mobility-enhanced lifestyle in our cities. What do you mean by that kind of terminology? Yeah, if you look at uh, smartphones, for example, Matt talked about smartphones. In the first quarter of 2014, 65% of all phones sold in the world were smartphones. That is how prevalent smartphones are in our lives. And if you look at the way people use smartphones versus a, a regular mobile phone that just has a keypad and mainly used for voice communications, on an average today, people touch their phone and interact with the world outside approximately 200 times a day. Wow. Okay, just imagine, I mean, you take out your phone, you're in a meeting, you're in a session like this, you're checking a Twitter feed, well, you're sending a message to somebody, yeah. checking weather, unbelievable amount of interaction that you're doing with um, the phone. Um, with that astonishing stat, you mean people over the age of 16 do that as well? Then? That is correct. Absolutely 250 correct. times yeah. a day. My daughter probably does it a little bit more than that. Uh, <laughs> she's on the phone all the time. That's a different issue to talk about. But yeah, nevertheless, okay. uh, so mobile phones, smartphones especially, are such an integral part of our lives on a daily basis. So what we have actually done is we have studied how people use phones in daily lives. During commute times, for example, in North America, 52% of people use their phones during commute times. In Latin America and Sao Paulo, it's 84%. Okay, phenomenal usage of phones in completely unbelievable situations. In a voice-centric network, we used to measure something called as a peak hour. And the peak hour indicated when people talked on their phone most. 
guess what? In a data-centric world, the peak hour is gone. You is know, what is, we, we are most interested now in what is the lowest point of the day when people use it. And you know what time that is? It's dinner time. At least people prioritize eating dinner, and they're not using their smartphones. During the rest of the day, the usage is almost constant. And we have a study that we have done, but it says the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning, for a majority of the people, is to touch your smartphone. And the last thing that you do, for okay. a lot of people, touch your Hands smartphone. Hands up for whom that is the case. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pretty much see, all of us. Statistically proven here. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a social science study that we've already done, and it's not even 10 o'clock. That's right. Good day's work so far. Um, which kind of moves us actually on quite nicely to another topic that I wanted to talk around, which is data. And you talked there, Aaron, about how we've gone from you know, peak demand and um, speech-driven use of phones to a data-centric model. What, what, so what, is that, what can we make of that? What does that mean for us? So who wants to take that one? Should we do, let's, let's take Matt. Yeah, take Matt and, I'll and then Aaron can yeah. give his view. So, so with this kind of proliferation of technology, people using smartphones every day, uh, th and this, this is, again, uh, connected lifestyle. So your phone is connected, your home is becoming connected, your car is connected, many of your healthcare products are connected. And what that means is there's this flood of data. And for most people, that, that actually doesn't mean much. But for data scientists, that's actually like the holy grail. And uh, just in my kind of world of looking at residential homes, uh, we've actually learned things from data already. And this is kind of, it's crazy. We've never had, let's say, a smoke alarm. Everyone has smoke alarms, but very few people have connected smoke alarms because we've only been doing it for a few months. Uh, it, as it turns out, now that we have hundreds of thousands of these things out there, we've actually learned from that data. And what we've learned is that the laws actually aren't keeping people safe enough. Wow. So like, like things like the carbon monoxide limits that the, the government has set for uh, kind of what's safe and what you should alarm at actually is too high. And you know, based on our data, uh, in, a, in, a kind of, in our study of hundreds of thousands of homes, 0.15% uh, of homes in our study had a carbon monoxide alarm. And that means people would probably die if they didn't have one. Right. Uh, what that means is like, if you look at kind of the greater scale of the United States, that's a lot of people who are gonna have these kinds of problems uh, throughout their lives. And, yeah, you know, right. that means these laws aren't effective. Enough, sure. Right? So, the, I mean, this is a classic case of the law of unexpected consequences. You know, so some a bright couple of guys like you in, in a garage say, right, we're going to save the world by um, reducing carbon and putting in um, remote heating control systems. But you actually end up with a genuinely absorbing and incredibly important study in carbon monoxide level in people's homes. What a great example that is of, of data. Yeah. And the use of data. Yeah. And what you do with that data, that's the next question. What, I mean, Aaron, what, what, what do you think we should do with data like that and the kinds of data that you're gathering? Actually, what we have done is we have created something called as a Network Society City Index. And we started doing this about three years ago just to document how a city is actually leveraging ICT for a triple bottom line benefit. And the triple bottom line benefit is social benefit, economic benefit, and of course, environmental benefit, right? And ICT then is classified as, is the infrastructure, right infrastructure available? Broadband internet, mobility, et cetera. Is it affordable? And if it is there and affordable, are people using it? So you map these three versus the triple bottom line benefit, and we have ranked the world cities, and it's actually available if you go to our uh, exhibit outside. This report is actually available in a published right. format. Okay. What we have now done, two things. We have made this index now available online. So anybody can go play with it, look at the data, manipulate it, you know, without the, the data, the reports, I mean, uh, generate what is useful for you. And what we have noticed now is that Stockholm and Oslo come out as the highest in terms of combining the benefits of ICT for triple bottom line benefit. And uh, today we have actually announced a special study on Dallas. We've released uh, you know, uh, where Dallas stands. And for those people who are interested, Dallas is ranked number 16 on the list, uh, just right after Sydney, right above uh, Moscow. So what we are able to then document, very similar to uh, what the keynote speech said, how you deliver services, civic services, is very, very important. And, and the leveraging of these uh, ICT capabilities in order to do that is so important so that they can actually build sustainable cities. And mobility acquires a completely different context, for example. It's not a choice of what transportation mechanism you take. It's more a choice of, do I need to go? Can I accomplish what I need to do from where I am using virtual you know, conferencing systems, collaboration systems, so on and so forth. Right. So completely different ways in which ICT is impacting cities. Okay.
And instantly, as we go along, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody wants to uh, uh, chime in with their own questions or comments or dissents, then um, in fact, already we've got, uh, I think it's a gentleman over, I've got bright lights in my face, so I can't fully see, but there's a, a hand up towards the back. If we can just get a roving microphone over, there we go. What would you like to say? Um, hi, I have a question for Matt. Um, it's, it's very scary to think about your house with your uh, thermostat and your smoke alarm and your refrigerator and your toilet and what have you connected to, to the internet and then hacked. Um, what are you guys doing Good to question. prevent Com that problem? Completely agree. Uh, security actually and, and, and the other side of privacy actually are incredibly important and kind of in building the internet of things, I don't like the buzzword but it's actually really appropriate here. Uh, we have to do it in a very secure manner where people can trust us and also trust that we're going to keep their data, sens their sensitive data very private. Uh, so things that we do uh, is that we actually employ some of the world's best hackers and their goal is to keep this, this data basically uh, safe from everybody else. So if we can't find an issue, uh, no one else will. And there's all, all these other things where use it, using open standards for security. Uh, and it, unfortunately, even with using kind of leading world industry standards, issues still happen. The key, and is, this is true for your banking system too, is when these issues happen, you have to fix them fast. And that's kind of the, the key to, to all kind of security work is uh, when things happen, you fix them really quickly and you're very public about it. Yeah. Uh, and like, if you guys remember this Heartbleed thing that happened a few months ago, uh, that kind of scared the entire internet. Uh, some of the fundamentals of security on the internet, we, we found an issue. Uh, the key was is that the entire internet responded and in a day or two, it was all fixed. Uh, these things will happen and, and unfortunately with software, nothing is perfect, but the key is to always be looking for issues and fixing them quickly. Yeah, um, and, and especially in your business, because I, I, I was saying to Matt backstage that I'm uh, trying out a, another, uh, like, sort of, if you like, intelligent heating system, and, and I love it to bits. And I, I, think, I feel as if I'm being very blokey about it, because I, I bore my friends in the pub by saying, I'm just going to turn up the heat in my kitchen by, you know, one degree, and I like showing off with it. And, and obviously, as the technology matures, we'll get beyond that, and it'll just become uh, a tool that we use. But coming back to the whole... Um, privacy and, I, to an extent, data security issue. One thing that has given me cause for concern is just that I know that the people who run this system, they know when I'm walking into my living room, they know when I'm in the kitchen, they know what time I leave the house in the morning. I suppose they would say, well, we don't really know that because it's all anonymized and it just goes into our system and it kind of learns from it. But I still think if they wanted to, they could just log on and find out what time I'm having breakfast in the morning. And it does make me feel a bit funny, <laughs> to be honest. It, it, it's, it's one of those things where we, you know, we have to earn people's trust. and you know, People have gotten to the point where they trust their carriers with their cell phones and kind of with their location data, and they've trusted Yahoo and Google and Microsoft with their email, uh, and th that trust has been earned. Uh, like, you know, people don't have their email spewed all over the internet. Uh, this is one of those things where people have to, we have to earn their trust, and we're doing everything we can to do that, you know, keeping data private and not, you know, everything's anonymized, and you know, we don't keep the data, and people have the right to delete things. Uh, yeah. Like, and and I suppose, it, in return, we end up with services that make our lives better. I exactly think. right. Yeah, which exactly. certainly is how I see it with, with my own intelligent heating system. You know, I've got lower energy bills and I'm saving a bit of carbon and I feel good about it. So, you know, it's, so we, we, we negotiate these things. Um, Aaron? I mean, look at your bank and credit card. They have known your purchasing behavior for years. But you trust them with that information and uh, they give you a promotion every now and then. You derive some benefit out of that. Now all that is moving into the digital world and, you know, we just have to learn to cope with that. Okay. And I am aware that already, uh, embarrassing, we're, we're running a little bit over, so we'll, we'll wrap things up reasonably soon, because we've got another great panel coming on. I don't want to crash too much into their time, but this, uh, this is quite an organic, kind of laid-back kind of summit, so we can probably let things slip a little bit. We'll, we, but we will move on, because I did want to talk to both of you guys about um, public-private. That's a massive mm. theme here at this conference. Mm. Many of the conversations I had at the garden party last night, mm. apart from Dylan Thomas, which was one conversation I had, but many of them were about this relationship between public and private. And, and I'm thinking, for instance, uh, with you, Aaron, in terms of, for instance, in the city, coming back to new cities, how um, mobile telephony providers and ISPs position their equipment. This is private stuff, but they need, you know, the public street furniture and, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know, kind of lampposts and so on, yeah. on to mount this that, uh, It's fascinating that you bring up that, because one of the fundamental things for mobility infrastructure is the location of your base stations, the infrastructure that actually provides coverage, et cetera, et cetera. And in cities, this is a huge issue because you've got to, you know, there are zoning rules, et cetera, and you've got to put it at the right place so that you can get the right coverage, but not make it an eyesore for people because you want cities to be nice environments. 
And uh, when you go to uh, a lot of different cities, you know, over the past few years, what we have been able to do is to disguise these things to look a little bit different. If you go to California, for example, we've got trees. They're not really trees. They are base stations, you know, designed to look as trees, just so that it is acceptable. What we have now been able to do is to look at a private-public effort which says, could we tap into city infrastructure, like core infrastructure like streetlights, and have a double role there, where you provide energy efficiency. For example, you start using LED lights there. And at the same time, you convert that city lamp pole into a wireless base station location as well. So together with Philips, we have launched a product now where we are able to bury all of the wireless infrastructure under the ground. So it looks like a nice city lamp pole. And you bring in energy efficiency by changing out traditional lighting systems with LED lighting systems. And uh, you get fantastic coverage in the urban areas as well. Now, there is some magic to it as well. During the holiday season, you can change the color of these lights. You know, if there is an emergency, not a, these lights can start flashing red as well. So you start to provide a completely different kind of digital infrastructure, but all this requires the pri private-public partnership to be in place. Cities realizing the benefit of providing this kind of infrastructure, and then everybody benefits from having all these capabilities. Okay, and, and Matt, how about you? Because obviously you spend a lot of time speaking to, uh, like especially energy utility companies. And, uh, two examples I can think of. So San Antonio and Austin, and speaking of Texas, uh, so th those cities actually own their own local utility. It's a municipal utility, and actually San Antonio is like this is one of the largest in the country. Uh, they were able to move very quickly to deploy Nest thermostats out to the population of the cities to help people save energy, achieve their efficiency goals, and also save the kind of these peak times. And they were able to move much faster than some of these very large private kind of regulated utilities because you know they were you know it's a city that's responsible for taking care of the, their own uh, constituencies. Right, okay, yeah, so it's, it's that example, I guess. of, And, and I suppose also you've got the, the issue that many of the um, utility companies, I think I'm right in saying here in the United States, are still publicly owned. I mean, we've had big deregulation in the UK and yeah. our energy is now in the private sector. So, so how do you, as a, I was going to say, it's hardly a startup anymore, but anyway, technology <laughs> company, uh, how do you... Um, negotiate with both you know, public and privately run utilities? And, and what we find is that uh, actually when we're working at the municipal level, we're able to make a ton of progress very quickly because the incentives are all aligned. Uh, you know, the, the, the city's job is to take care of its people. Whereas if you negotiate with like PG&E, which is responsible for kind of half of California, uh, it's very different. Their job is to make money and uh, they're, not, they're less accountable. They're more accountable to kind of the PUC at the state level. They're, you know, they're, they're less motivated to move quickly. So for us, we found a lot of great benefits working with cities, and that's actually where we've made some of the biggest strides in getting this out to people's homes. Okay, right. Um, so it, I think we are going to have to wrap it up quite soon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave with one final question to our panelists. Although we do, let's, let's take a, a question here. There's a lady with her hand up, and she's very keen to make a, a comment. So just we've got a roving microphone. It's this lovely lady who's about six rows back from the front, and the microphone's been passed on like the Olympic torch, the baton <laughs> of truth is being passed to this lady. See how I filled there? This is what we do on the radio. Hi, my name is Eona Strelitz from London. Um, I want to join up what uh, you guys are talking about with Paul Romer's conversation. So he talked about the importance of space-centric mobility for urban productivity. And in fact, he gave a fantastic per, uh, GDP figure from Shenzhen that was linked to space. And both of you are talking about new potentials for and new realities of productivity that are digitally enabled. So my question to the panel is, do you think that the uh, uh, proliferation of connections that we can have on a digital platform will actually also in, uh, lead to an associated increase in space-bound travel, in physical mobility, or do you think that it will lead to less? I know that it is a prediction, but I'm interested to hear your view. And brief answers, if you will, gentlemen. So, so uh, what we're seeing is that uh, as connectivity has been more prolific and as people have faster internet in their homes, they may not need to commute as much. And one of the things that, that we've been doing, at least as, as being part of Google, is using teleconferencing way more than we ever have. So as a startup, you know, you're all in one place, you're all in one room working together. Uh, as, as we've expanded out to you know, 70 different countries of having offices, uh, you can do basically video conferencing with anybody there. Presumably, they have fast internet. So much like you have basic city infrastructure like roads for mobility and water and electricity, 
connectivity is becoming one of those basic infrastructures that you have to have, and if it's not good enough, then people are gonna need to drive around to go talk to people for business and pleasure. You know, my take on it is this. I think the reason for which you would commute, the reason for which you would be mobile, would be different. You wouldn't have to do it for the sake of work, right? But you would free up time from your day, so you're more productive, you don't have to take a one and a half hour commute, you save the time, you're more productive. Maybe it frees up some time in the evening for you to do something else, you know, have a cultural interaction, a social interaction, whatever. So it might not translate into a direct drop in mobility, but you might travel for completely different purposes, and then the pattern shifts. So it, you don't have those peak travel time during the day when people go to work and come back. It might be completely different like the transition from voice to data in mobile networks. Okay, well on that note we'll leave it. So Aaron Bikshashvavan, who was just speaking there as well from Ericsson, and Matt Rogers of Nest, thank you both very much indeed. And for you all being here nice and early this morning as well. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, gentlemen. Thank you. Great. Cheers, Aaron. Thank you.